prayer. I don't know about you, but I've, I've fallen in love with the Lord's Prayer m more than I did before. Not, not that I didn't appreciate it before. I really liked it. It was so pretty cool. But man, I'm just falling in love with it all over again. I hope some of you guys are too. And so it's a very familiar, right? The, God, the Lord's Prayer is something very familiar that you probably, this could be the first time you showing up to church ever, and you probably can quote half of it because it gets used so often. But see, that's the, that's the wonderful thing, guys, about even going back and looking at old things again, because it's so easy for us to become familiar with God's word and familiar with the truth that we grow bored of it or it becomes cliche, right? We say the same thing over and over again, read the same thing over and over again, and, and it loses its essence if we're not super careful. So today, when we look at today, last week we gave uh, the sermon title was a prayer for uh, mental health, but today is going to be a prayer for living in God's will, a prayer for living in God's will. Now that one, uh, if you were with us last year, there was a, a few weeks that we just really you know, focused in on this. And the reason is because this one always tends to be a very high Google searched, um, a high, there's a high desire always for knowing what is the will of God for my life? What is the will of God for my life? I know that was for me. I felt like that. And I was consumed by that because listen, if you're a Christian, you should be concerned with the will of God. In fact, this was, I don't know if may, I think everybody's experience would be close, but let me just share mine. Like, I was so consumed with knowing what God's will was, was because I started living my own and realized just the disaster that my life had become. And so I was so grateful for God, so grateful for the gift of grace. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to step out of bounds ever again. Are you, anybody with me on that, at least? I don't want to step out of bounds. Like, I want to be like in. I don't even want to tiptoe the line. Like, I want to be on the opposite. I want to be like perfect in your will so I don't get lost again. So I don't, I don't wreck and hurt other people, hurt me. And so I was super in and, and, and passionate about that. Um, but then there was also a little bit of a struggle because, see, in my case, when I was looking at that, I didn't want to fall away. And so it's like I wanted to follow God's will, not so much I mean, I wanted to walk with God, but I was more like, I just don't want to do that, if that makes sense. Like, I was, a, I was more concerned about the bad than the good, you know? I was concerned about screwing it up instead of just enjoying the, the journey. And, and another part that really made it hard for me, which I think is too, makes it hard for others, is, is this part right here. Because a lot of us pray, Lord, what's your will for my life? What's your will? And a lot of times when we pray that, you're asking what? You're saying, Lord, what should I do? Yes or no? When you pray, Lord, what is your will for my life? We tend to pray. Let me re remix that. What do you want me to do now? That's how we pray it, don't we? Right? That's how we pray it. That's the wrong way to pray. Now, am I saying that should you ask God, God, I need help. What should I do right now? I'm not saying not to do that. It, it's important to process that. In fact, we know that as Christians, we've mentioned this. I'll do it quickly. How does a Christian make decisions? How should a Christian make decisions, especially with seeking out what is God's will? Well, God told us we make God's decisions by godly counsel and godly wisdom, right? You don't make, you don't make uh, decisions with just certain people. Like, listen, guys, I'm telling you something. Let me give you some free advice here, all right? Surround yourself with people who love you enough to tell you the truth, even if you don't like it, all right? Because here's the thing. If all you do is surround yourself with people who tell you what you want to hear, you're going to be left with a bunch of people with nothing to say. I got to say that one again. All right, I'm going to say that one again. Not because I wanted a better reaction. Not. It's because you really need to hear me. You need to surround yourself with people who are willing to tell you the truth, what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Because if you only surround yourself with people who tell you what you want to hear, you're surrounding yourself with a bunch of people that will have nothing to say, nothing to give you of, of, of value. Thank you. And so it matters. And so how do we make decisions? Well, we pray to the Lord, yes. Can God give some wisdom? And God? Yes, but he can guide our minds. And how? When we understand God's will, all right, well, is this a sin to do this? Is it, is it foolish to do this? And when you do it with godly counsel, you can make a lot of very wise decisions without ever having to hear a, thus saith the Lord, you know? And, and that's how it works. That's how it works better. Now, we pray for the directions. That's very, very important. But here's the problem is what I said a minute ago. We pray, Lord, what is your will for me? Really, you're really praying, what, you, what do you want me to do? But a lot of us aren't honest. 
do you really want God to do you really want God to tell you what he wants you to do? Or are you hoping that he says, you know what, the thing that you want to do? Yeah, do that. You pray. I've done this. So I'm putting myself, I'm with you. I'm preaching to myself. I'm sitting in right th- th- that chair right there because I've done this. And I, have, and I can have the tendency to do this. Lord, what's your will for my life? What's your will for my life? I don't want his will. I want him to give me mine. That's the problem. A lot, of the, a lot of the times when you've ever prayed, what is your will for my life? Deep down, you don't want him to answer that. What you want him to do is tell you, hey, your will be done. Tito, your will be done. That's, I want that. You go ahead. You're good. Run that. Run that. And then I guarantee you, that I think this is the struggle so much because God has actually, and I'm going to show you, God has actually told us plainly. You ever seen those instruction books like, you know, Cooking for Dummies? You ever seen one of those? Right, right? Cooking for Dummies, you know, uh, whatever for dummies. They have, they have everything. The dude literally says over and over again, God himself, this is my will printed. God, what's your will for my life? What's your will? What's, I told you, it's right. No, no, but no, what's, what's your will? And so we, it's like, no, no, not that. I, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear this. You know what you do when you're, when you're like that, when you pray, let your will be done, and he said it here, and you don't want to look at it, and you ignore it? You're the guy. You're like that person at a restaurant who, when, they, when the person brings you the food, you're be like, excuse me, that is not what I ordered. Send it back. You know? Look, w- there's two people. Well, you got two types of people in the world. You got the ones who will complain about the food and have it sent back. You're going to call the manager. You're going to call the owner. You're going to call the CEO if you can. You're going to make a whole show because they're means like, I asked for caramelized onions, not raw. Send it back, right? You're going to do that. You got those type of people in the room. And then you got the others who not complain about the food and will complain to management. You got the people who are complaining about the complainers. I'm like, stop. No, just eat it. Like, well, don't. They're going to, Charlie, they're going to spit in our food now, man. Don't leave it alone. Why you got to make a big deal? Just, it's food. Come on, Charlie. I don't know who Charlie is. I'm just making it up. But listen, <laughs> I don't even know Charlie. But all right, am, am I not like, I mean, who's, who's the one that will say, I will make a scene? Some of y'all would. Some of y'all would. Some of you would like die inside. Some of you die inside out of pure embarrassment, right? You just don't want that. Leah, you don't want that. Guys, you do the same thing. We'll say, Lord, what's your will for my life? I was like, oh, oh here, let's go to this. Uh, this is my will. I'm like, no, that's not what I want. So I'm going to send it back, God. I need, some, I need you to come back with something else that I'm going to be happy with. We do the same thing. And he comes back with the same plate. <laughs> but no, that's not what I want. But aren't you asking me for my will? Yeah, here you go. But that's not what I want. And see, that's the problem. Our problem is, is that we have our own will that we prefer. What makes it hard? Why is it so hard for people to find God's will? Why, and and people write books about it and this and that, why? It's hard to figure out God's will because you have one that you would rather prefer. That's the problem. And here's the crazy part, is that the closer that you hold on to your will, okay, the further you end up from his. The more you, the closer you hold on to your will, you will end up farther from his and so we need to ask ourselves if we're going to pray lord may your will be done let's make sure we understand what his will is if you really want to pray him for to him to do it all right so let's look we're going to look at matthew chapter 6 verse 10 and uh only a little it's a short verse and here it you see it right here what is it let's all read it together it's a short verse guys online you can say it or type it read it together it says what your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, this is the third petition. Uh, the, the Lord's Prayer is b- broken up into six different things. Now, notice that I have Matthew 6.10. I don't have Luke. This is the first time in the Lord's Prayer that we have a very big difference. Now, um, in Matthew, this is the most detailed Lord's Prayer, the one that you've probably heard or memorized. You're quoting Matthew. You're, th- this is where you're doing. Matthew was there. He was an apostle with Jesus. He heard the sermon when Jesus taught it. He heard it a lot. Now, in Luke, we get a different one. Luke is a a, a disciple, asked Jesus, Jesus, I know you've taught on prayer before, and I see you praying, but 
listen, I, there has to be more. Can you teach us how to pray? And what does Jesus do? Sure. And he brings the same meal out. And literally, he brings the same lesson again. But it's different. So the one in Luke is summarized. And it says, Father in heaven. No, he says, uh, uh, well, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm losing it as I'm saying. He says, Father, Father, uh, your kingdom come. It's missing, you know, Father, you know, may your, 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 name, be, your name be holy and your kingdom come. It's, it's different. There's words that are missing. And so, again, this is another reminder, guys, that the Lord's Prayer is a pattern of praying. It's a pattern of praying. The fact that Jesus, he didn't forget his own lesson. Did he misquote his own, you know, teaching? No, because here's the thing. The idea of praying is not so much getting the words right. It's getting your heart right. Like God is concerned about the attitude of your heart more than so much the words out of your mouth. If you're stressing about saying it right, you're already missing it. You're forgetting that he's a father. And so, um, but at the same time, just because in Luke, it doesn't have your kingdom come. I mean, I'm sorry, it doesn't have your will be done. It just says, hallowed be your name, uh, your kingdom come. Give us this day. Now, so what, what do we do with that? Well, here's the thing, because see, the kingdom and his will go hand in hand. You can't have his kingdom without the will of the king. You see it? So G just because Jesus omitted it doesn't mean it is not as important. No, he's showing even in the omission that no, it's embedded. If you want his kingdom to come, which is a, we talked about that this last week, it's a relationship with God. The kingdom of God is a relationship with the king. And so in order to have a relationship with the king, you have to bow even and you know, surrender even your will. Tell me that's not a relationship. Hello, married couples. Um, tell me the biggest struggles that you've ever had in your marriages is because you had a way of doing things and she had a way of doing things and all y'all do is just butt heads. You know what that is? That's a battle of the wills. You have a will, she has a will, that he has a will, and we're going to see who, who wins in the end. Same thing. In a relationship with God, the king has a will. So do we. Who do you think is going to win that battle, by the way? Okay, so let's just be honest. And so the thing, guys, is you have to understand that the kingdom comes with a will. And so what is his will? All right, let me, I'm going to give you a couple things. So if you're taking notes, you can look at a couple stuff. The first thing I want you to understand about his will, I already hinted to this. His will is revealed in his word. Okay, his will is revealed in his word. And you got to understand and get a better definition of what will is. Guys, his will is nothing but his desires. That's what that means. What is the will of God? Meaning, it's what does he want? What is his desires? That's it, all right? That's it right there. By the way, have you not even uh, paused and wondered and just realized the Lord's prayer actually also reveals the Lord's will? Did you not even catch that so far? When Jesus says, pray like this, what is he saying? I want you to pray like this. It, I desire for you to pray like this. The Lord's prayer actually reveals the Lord's will. And what is the Lord's will? What does he desire? He desires his name to be honored as holy. He desires that his kingdom come in the hearts of men and women. He desires that his will is done. He desires that you look to him for daily bread. He desires his will is for you to be able to forgive others as he forgives you. It is his will and his desire to lead you from temptation and not be, fall prey to the enemy. You see that? The Lord's prayer reveals the Lord's will. And guys, over and over again. And here's why the, the whole thing, actually, his word reveals his will. Because when you understand the nature and character of God, you understand his desires. Over and over and over again, we see positive and negative examples of what people did and how God responds. And his word reveals his will. And then there's the few, my will is dot, dot, dot. I'm going to show you uh, a few of them. And it's also that. But here's the thing about his will. I want you to catch this. And this is, this is the hard part. Again, why it's also hard to understand God's will, because God's will is not a secret. God's will is, is not a secret. It's right here. It's not a secret, but God's will is a mystery. And that's the tough part. His, God's will is not a secret. He tells, this is who I am. But God's will is a mystery because the truth of God, and I, I say this a lot and I try to challenge you guys. Listen, if, you, if you're here, you're listening, you're watching or you're reading, the point of even the Bible is not for you to master information. The point is for this truth to master you. It's about information that causes transformation. Listen, you and I cannot truly 
fully understand the perfectness of who God is. We have a limited mind. <laughs> we have a limited mind to an infinite God. That's like trying to fit a whole, the whole ocean, like to swallow the whole ocean in one shot. You know, you can't do that. You cannot swallow the whole ocean in one shot. That's like trying to say, okay, I just want to know the will of God. You can't really. You can, but you can't. It's, a, it's not a secret. We can know who he is, but it's a mystery though. It's, it's, it's an ocean that, that has no bottom because it's who God is. If God is God, then he should be like that. He should be like that. So not only is his will revealed in his word, there's, his word reveals two types of wills. So guys, you guys can categorize his will in two different categories. The first one is this, his sovereign plan. And the other kind of will is his divine command. I want you to know the difference because when you see things in here, you need to know the difference. There's two types of the will of God. There's the sovereign plan and there's the divine command. The sovereign plan is this, guys. Hey, whatever, whatever the king wants, the king's going to get. It's going to happen. All right? I, I know maybe it's like that at the house, right? Hey, it's say, hey, mom, what are we eating? All right, well, this is what we're eating, but I don't want that. It's what I cooked, right? And so it's what it is. You don't, you don't like it? You don't eat. It's that easy. All right? That's the, that's the will that's just being exerted, right? That's mama's will being exerted. Oh, it's going to happen. All right? That's what it is. And so, guys, listen, God has a sovereign plan that has been going on since the day he said, let there be light. The day God said, let there be light, there has been a chain reaction of events that never once was God caught off guard. Okay? God was not there in the garden one day, and, or he was out busy. He just created everything, and then he wasn't out doing this or talking to the angels and have, you know, having fun. And, blah, blah. and then he was like, what, what, what's going on? What, is, that, what, is the devil? The, what do you, no, don't eat that. Oh, my gosh. Like, God did not have an oops moment, okay? As a parent, I've had a few oops moment. Yes, I have lost a child from time to time, okay? That has happened, all right? It has happened from time to time. And like, wait, where are they? Oh, okay, there they are. Okay. There's nothing more scarier as a parent than silence. Oh, no. Something's bad. Yeah, when it's too quiet, something's not good. Something's not good. Listen, God did not have an oops moment. He didn't, you know, Adam and Eve didn't fall under the radar, and then they all messed up, and now God's, oh, man, now what am I going to do? All right, angels, and we got to go back to the drawing board here. These guys all messed it up, you know. That's the hard part. You see, this is the part of the mystery of the will of God. It was always his will. It was his plan. He factored it in that Adam and Eve were going to do what they gonna, that we're going to do, and that darkness was going to enter the world. It's a mystery. Why, God? Why? Why would you allow that? Why would you? Why? It's a mystery. It's hard. Now, we, if, with time, we could talk about that. You know, but it's, it's hard to embrace that. His, so his, but here's the thing. His sovereign plan that started in Genesis, um, it's going to finish in Revelation. Like, whatever his plan was, and this is how awesome God's plan is, that no matter what has happened and what, whatever will happen, his plan is going to be executed to perfection, 100%. And, and without God having to touch anything. Like, God can see he saw it all. His plan is going to be fulfilled no matter what. That, you know what that means? That means you and I can't screw it up. That means the devil can't undo his plan, can't stop his plan, can't even slow it down for 2.5 seconds. Nothing. He can't even reverse the plan. The sovereign plan of God, of him restoring all things and making a people to himself, it's going to happen no matter what. Because that's what the king decreed. That's the sovereign plan of God. But then you have his divine command. His divine commands are things in which he wishes that we do, but it's not necessarily means it's going to happen. We see, um, we see that in Matthew 7, 21. Um, this is the part, guys, again, when, when you got to understand, Romans 12 speaks of, Paul says, how do you know the will of God? He says, when you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, you will know the will of God. What does that mean? When you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, of what? Of who Christ is and what he's done. The more the truth gets into you, shapes you, it's going to renew your mind. It's going to renew your thinking. And you will know the will of God through the word of God. And, but 
there's also a ramification. That's the divine plan. That's, but that's also his desire. His desire is that our hearts are transformed. But Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says of the future, there's going to be a, he's going to gather all people into himself. Everybody who's ever lived. It's going to be a, man, if I've gone through some long lines at like, you know, Disney and stuff, I, you know, I know God has to have a system because everybody who's ever lived, what kind of line is that going to look like, you know? But so I'm curious, but I'm, I'm sure he's thought about it. And he's got it down. But think about this. Jesus says everyone who's ever lived will stand before him. And to those on his left, I'm sorry, you're on my left, so don't take it personal, all right? Those on my left, he's going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. And these people are going to bring up and say, a lot of them are going to be very religious people. Jesus, how, how do we not know you? We, we did this in your name. We casted out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. We did this in your name. How do we not know you? How are you sending us away to hell? And he says, listen, it's not me. I'm not doing it. It's, it's, I'm, I'm doing it, but it's, it's your will. You know my name, but I don't know you. See, the, there's going to be even religious people. And this is the, listen to this. This religious group, not y'all, but you know what I'm saying. This religious group. They used the name of the Lord Jesus without ever surrendering to the name of the Lord Jesus. They used it without really trusting it. That's not enough, guys. It is not enough to be able to say, I go to church or I know this or I know that. I know him. I know him. All right? Does it matter? Does he know you? Is there that, did you surrender? Is that their relationship that matters? And so, and notice Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, he says, there will be people who will not enter into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, you know why? Because they didn't do my will. They didn't do my will. And so they're not getting in. Now, do you also see where the hyperfixation on, well, then what's your will? Uh, I don't want to, what's your will for my life? Because if, if I don't do your will, that means I go to hell. Then, then what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? You know, like, do you see where the craziness can come in right here? Because those who go to heaven are the ones who do God's will. But hold on. Do we go to heaven because of what we've done? Do you see the danger there? You see where the enemy is like, oh, see, see, you, you got you to gotta be a perfect Christian. You got to be perfectly aligned with the will of God because if not, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. No. The gift of eternal life is a free gift. We don't get into heaven because of what we've done. We get into heaven because of what Jesus has done. And that we trusted in that and not in what we do. That's the thing. So then what is Jesus talking about here? Notice. I did this in your name. I did this in your name. They are, they are holding on to their will. God says, you're doing all that. I never told you to do it. I never led you to, I didn't want you to, and you did it not for my good reasons, you did it for yourself. So do you see the dangers here about the selfishness, about our will? This is what happens, the, whole, the longer you hold on to your will, you're going to end up far away from the will of God. Because God's divine command is this, God's true will is for all men to be saved. He wants all men to be saved, but just because he wants everyone to be saved doesn't mean everyone will. Jesus himself said it. Not everybody will because they didn't do my will. And what's my will? They never trusted in me. They kept trusting in themselves. They kept trusting in even in their religious behavior, thinking that that was going to be enough. It wasn't. So guys, everything you can chop it up, everything in God's word, when it comes to his will, it's either a part of his divine plan, his divine, I'm sorry, sovereign plan, which is going to happen no matter what, or it's his divine command and this is the part of human responsibility guys the train is heading in in you know the train of god's plan is heading in the right direction and it's going to happen it's our part of the human responsibility to be on that train you know we got to get on that train and you know it's pretty crazy check this out if i'm if i'm in a train heading this way all right the train is heading this way but i'm facing that way and i'm walking in the opposite direction the train is going that way but i'm walking this way and where am i going to end up wherever the train ends up, right? It doesn't matter if I'm walking this way and then this way, or I'm standing still on the train. I'm not doing nothing on the train. If the train is moving in one direction, where am I going to end up? Where the train's going. And see, when you put your trust in Christ, you're on the train. And whether you are in line with what God is doing, or you're just kind of having a day and you're really not, or you're being rebellious and having those moments, when you're on the train, you're on the train. You're ending up 
where he desires for you to be. But his will is for you to be on the train. And how do you do that? You trust in his name. That's what he wants. That's his sovereign. That's what his will is. Some of you guys are like, oh, no, I want to know if I'm supposed to marry this person. I want to know if I'm supposed, what's, where, where I'm supposed to, should I move? Should I not? Should I go to the school? That's what I want. Slow down. Chill. Uh, even there. Because here I'm trying to tell you, this is what God's wants are. And probably deep down inside, I'm like, but that's not what I want. Exactly. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Exactly. Do you even care about what God wants? I'm talking to the Christians for a second. Because if, you know, if, if you're a Christian, do you care about what he wants? That's what a relationship is all based on. Submission and surrender to one another. So that's what his will is. It's what he wants. And it's in his word. And this is the two things. So now, how is God's will done on earth? Right? Because that's the prayer, right? Lord, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right? We know that he, Lord, what you want to do, you're going to do it. Do it. But also, there's the divine command, right? That other side of it. Now, here's the thing I want to warn you guys. Because sometimes when we say this thing, there's a phrase that says, Lord, may your will be done on earth. What was the next part? As it is. So that means that in heaven, there is, his will is, is, is operating in perfection in heaven. Where does it need to operate? On earth. Because in heaven is not the problem. Where's the problem? It's on earth. That's why we pray, Lord, may you will be done on earth as it is already in heaven. But be careful because this does not mean, this is not a command that says as Christians, we need to replicate. We need to recreate heaven on earth. Uh, there's, there's, you can't do that. that be careful because there's some, there's some people that believe in that, that we have to replicate heaven on earth. Meaning, are there wars in heaven? So we need to make sure there's no wars on earth. Is there racism in heaven? No. So that means we have to eradicate racism on earth. Is there hunger in heaven? No. Is there need in heaven? No. So we have to eradicate hunger and need over here. Is there sickness in heaven? No. So that means that there must be no sickness on the earth. Yikes. All right? No. Because Jesus says this world is passing away. Now, does it mean that we don't help people get better or meet needs or, or reconcile it? No, it, of course that's, of course, we're supposed to do those things, but it doesn't mean that we have to recreate heaven on earth, and that's going to be on us. Yikes. You know, how many of us can barely even make a cheese sandwich and, and, and not burn that? You think we're going to be able to replicate, or, or, you know, or heaven on earth like that? No. Listen, it's not about that. It's not replicating. It's about reflecting Christ on earth. His will, Lord, may your will be done. And what is his will? That, Lord, the things that you want, may, may it happen. May it happen, but he knows and we should know it is not about saving earth. It's about the people. God is going to, in his sovereign plan, he's going he's to restore everything. But this is not a command that we need to make bring, pull heaven to earth like that. It's bigger than that. You, you can get really new agey and, and really out of bounds. You can, you can kind of float off, you know, out in the middle of nowhere really easy if you do that. So, Here's about God's will I kind of hinted to earlier, but I'm going to say it differently. You know, God's word says that you are supposed to grow in understanding his will without ever knowing it. This is part of, it's not a secret, but it's a mystery. Now hang in there with me, guys, because this is important for you. Because I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is just assaulting your own desire right now. Because everything in that I'm saying right now is probably what you don't want to hear. And I'm just going to keep putting it into it until it breaks, all right? So listen, you and I are supposed to grow in understanding his will. And you, you and I can understand his will without ever truly, fully knowing, quote, quote, knowing the will. Again, to know his will perfectly is like trying to swallow the ocean in one, in one gulp. You can't do that. But we can grow in understanding it. You know, we can, we can take a couple sips, you know, and keep going. That's what we're called to do. In fact, uh, let me read something. Ephesians chapter 5. I'll read it closely. I think we have it on the screen for you guys. Each, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17 Paul, in many different ways, he says this, but here's one I'm just going to pick. He says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Look at the word understand. Understand is not this, you know, idea of just saying, huddle up in a prayer, huddle up into, until the, the heavens break and the sky is split and you hear the voice showing up like a rushing wind and now you're going to know the will of God. No, the word understanding actually implies logic combined with um, trust in who his word is. 
again, that transformation there. Guys, you and I are supposed to grow in understanding what the will of God is. And by the way, he keeps going and actually talks about what the will of God is. He talks about be filled with the spirit. And that has nothing to do with feeling this ecstatic, mystical experience. It's just being filled with the truth of the spirit, the truth of God. In uh, our benediction is Romans 15, 13. And some of us, uh, we were going to read it at the end of the service today. And at the, my New Year's sermon was that, right? To say we are supposed to be filled with the truth of God until we overflow with the truth of God. That, it's the same thing. Paul is saying the same thing in different ways. And so to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the truth of the Spirit. So much so that we are speaking and singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making music. Does it matter the songs that we sing? Does it matter if we're singing songs, not singing songs? No, it doesn't matter if what you're speaking or singing. What it, the point is the content of what you're singing and speaking. That the spirit, the truth is in you so much that it is overflowing. It is working through you, even to the point that it's changing your affections. You're giving thanks for all things. Verse 21 in, in Ephesians submitting to one another in love. And there's the anchor again. We always land on this. Loving one another, loving one another. Listen, if somebody claims, or they say, oh, I'm Holy Ghost Spirit filled and stuff like that, they might be. But the biggest evidence are, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? It's, are you loving like Jesus? Not if you had a mystical experience. The true evidence of if you are filled with the Holy Spirit is if you are reflecting the Spirit of Christ more and more. Where's the love? Is where's the love there? Where's the life transformation? That's where it is. And so this is the part when he says, and this is called, we got to grow in this understanding. Keep knowing God. Look, I commend all of you for showing up and probably hearing a lot of verses that you've already heard before. You know, listen, I'm, you're not going to read something new. Like, oh my gosh, did, you know, what's new in the Bible today? You know, like this is the same thing. You know, it hasn't been changed. It hasn't been edited. We keep on showing up to read a very old book. Why? Because we keep seeing new things, the deeper we go inside, because we're growing in our understanding. We're growing in our understanding. But let me encourage you guys, be careful. You will never know the will of God fully, not even for your own life. Do you know how I know that? Jesus said it. Do you know that there's a part that God's will for you, right? That's a big one. God has a plan. God has a purpose for your life. Listen, true. God has a plan and a purpose for the world, all right? And what matters most is not, well, how are you going to live? But first off, did you trust in Christ? That's the big one. But do you guys know how I know that there's going to, you, you, there is no way. There is no way for you to know fully God's will for your own life. Because Jesus said so. In Matthew 25, remember in that group that I was telling you about? Hey, those on your left, you didn't make it. And he actually added a detail. You know, I was in jail, you didn't visit me. I was hungry, you never gave me food. I was thirsty, you never gave me a drink. And they complain. When were you in jail? You know, I'm like, wait, what? Like, you didn't call me. You know, you didn't tell me you were in jail. I didn't know you were hungry, naked, bro. I got clothes. I could have given you stuff. Why didn't you tell? Bro, that's on you. You let me know. Speak up. All right? Speak up. I would have done it. Not nah, gone. Ah, oh, then the people on my right. You guys picked a good chair today. All right. The people on my right. He says, enter into the kingdom. Enter into the kingdom of eternal rest. Why? Because they did the will of God. And you're going to see why enter into the kingdom of eternal rest. He says, because when I was hungry, you guys gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in jail, you came and visited me. And then those people had a very similar shocked experience. They said, Jesus, you were in jail. What'd you do? Right? I'm like, wait, when? You were in jail. Jesus, you were hungry? You were, when? I, and, and he says, and you did it for me. I was like saying, Jesus, I would have remembered. I would have remembered if we would have done something to you. I, we didn't do those things. We didn't do any of those things. And Jesus says, if you did it for the least of these, it's like you did it for me. So the group on the right was living in the will of God, and they were doing things according to the will of God, and they didn't even know it. You see what I'm saying? You can't know God's will perfectly. Now, how were they walking? See, look at this. How were they walking in the will of the Lord, and they didn't even know it? Because they were not concerned about his will, they were concerned with him. Do you see that? The more you are concerned about who God is, you are going to find yourself doing things without even realizing it. I'm telling you, heaven's going to be a place of just, what? I, I didn't even know. I didn't even think. I thought, I thought that wasted my time. I, I didn't even know. 
And God's going to go, oh, yeah, I used it all. That was me, by the way. So, yeah, but thank you for, you know, but do you see what I'm saying, guys? It's like you can actually walk in his will without even knowing it. Because the goal is not his will. You don't, don't be so, guys, even, hmm, oh, forget it, I'm getting frustrated because I've done this, and I hate the fact that I wasted so much my own time with this. I made an idol of God's will. I did that. I made an idol of his will because it was just this. And, and I was my, at one point, like literally, I, I was getting my own sense of worth and value from how good I was at executing his will. I was still selfish, but I baptized my selfishness. You see that? I Christianized the selfishness. And that's the crazy part, guys. So listen, you are called to grow in understanding. And this is why I say here, look, this, you want God's will? Lord, may your will be done. All right, you know what you should be praying for? It sits right here. Your focus, the will of God for you, his divine command and his sovereign plan have this in common. The focus should be on you becoming more than it should be on you doing. All right? This is why I tell you before, right? You said a minute ago, Lord, what is your will? Let me remix that. What do you want me to do? That's the wrong way of praying. The real, the real way that we should pray, what is your will for my life is, Lord, who should I become? Did you ever get that question growing up? Hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? Right? What do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? Anybody sick of that question and you just hated it? What do you want to do when you grow up? I don't know. You know, it's like, you know, I don't know. You can figure it out. You know, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to do when you grow up? You know, it's a better question that we should be asking our kids. And I try to ask them that. I, I try to do that. I should do better. I'm not perfect. You know what's a better question? When you grow up, who do you want to become? That's better. Because jobs change. Technology changes. Who do you want to be when you grow up? I pray that you guys are men of integrity, men of honor, men who love the Lord, men who serve, men who love their wives and their husbands and whoever love their neighbors. Bold, confident in who Christ is. That's what I want them to be. I want them to be that. Now, do you see how... I don't care what job you're doing. If you're that, I'm happy. You feel me? I, I want them to be hard workers. I want to be this. I want, if you, that's who you are. And so this is the part, guys, what I'm trying to tell you is that if you focus on who you are becoming, the doing is going to happen automatically. But if all you're doing is focused on the doing, you never become. You feel me? And this is good news for some of you because some of you are probably exhausted in doing you try and try and try and fail and fail and fail, and you're not enough. It's good. So give up. Stop focusing on so much on the doing and focus on who you are becoming. And you will see the doing will, God will handle the doing on its own. And now this, this could be a frustrating thing because you can always look back and say, man, I've come a long way. That's good. But I got so much farther to go. True. But hey. That's what grace comes in. That's where the grace of God comes in. He's not grading me based on A plus or he better than you. It's like, no, you know, he loves us all the same. But let me read 1 Thessalonians. Look at this little verse here. Paul says to another church, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, he says the same thing. For this is God's will, plain dot, dot, dot. This is his will. Your sanctification. Do you know what your sanctification is? You're becoming. Guys, God has, um, there's this, this will that he has. His sovereign will is going to be glorification. He's going to be glorified. This is sovereign will. His divine command involves salvation and sanctification. Salvation means that you trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins. Sanctification is this, all right? Salvation is, Lord, I'm saved. And, and what that's, you know, that happened because you trusted in Christ. Salvation is, sanctifica is, is, salvation is that. Sanctification is learning how to live as a saved person. You see that? If you're saved, then that should mark your life. For example, again, imagine, you, you all know this, if you get married, if you're in a dating relationship, certain things should change, right? Certain things should change. If you're in a dating relationship, certain, I, 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 I've heard somebody say, you will never realize how selfish you are until you get married. There, right? Uh, bro, for real. You will never realize how self-centered and selfish you have always been until you get married. Woo! That's something right there. I never want to get married now. And I'm like, listen, I don't care. You move it out anyways. If you don't want to get married, you still move it out. All right, look, man, but sanctification is, remember we talked about the kingdom of God, right? Lord, may your kingdom come, which is a relationship with the king. 
and now your will be done. You know what you pray when you pray those two things? May your kingdom come, may your will be done. Lord, I want a relationship with you. All right, cool. So how does this relationship look like? That's what you're praying. What does this relationship with you look like now? That is what it means to pray. Lord, may your will be done. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, he talks about that. He talks a lot about, if he keeps on going. He says, and he says about this, sanctification. And then he gives examples, so you can read it later. You know, not living in your selfish passions, but living for the Lord. Um, God has called us not to impurity, but to holiness, to living light with him. And now let me warn you there, guys. I'm going to pause you again. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, if we're, we're on a tour, I'm like, look, be careful over there. There's a speed trap there. That's what I'm, I'm showing you guys where all the speed traps are. The one speed trap was you can make, a, you can make an idol of the will of God. You know, what the other, you know how you make specifically an idol of the will of God? His will for you is sanctification, meaning holiness, meaning that you are sinning less and less. Doesn't mean you'll ever be sinless. Tell somebody to go somewhere if they ever tell you. You can never be sinless in this world, all right? Tell somebody to go somewhere because they don't know what they're saying. But it is impossible. It is possible, I'm sorry, to grow, to be more patient, to be more kind, to be more generous, to be more. You can be better. You can be a better person because that's what the love of God will do to you. That's what holiness looks like. You're looking more and more like him. We can never be holy, perfect, but we can grow in that understanding. We can be shaped in those things, but be careful with this idol now because here's the other one. Because now if the enemy can't get you to follow God, he's going to try to get you to misunderstand what it looks like to follow God. Because now as you're following God and you're becoming more and more into the image of Christ, that's when the timer will go off. And if you're not careful, as you are growing in the nature of God and you're becoming a better person, I don't know if some of you can see it already. You see where, 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 the, where the trap is? The trap is now you can be prideful about how holy you are compared to other people. Oh, these people, this. I'm holier than so-and-so. Very easy to fall back into selfishness even while pursuing God with good intentions. If you're not careful with your heart, you can grow, you can be prideful even in your own religion, prideful even in your own relationship with God. Oh, I'm better than so-and-so and this. I'm, I don't, they, they don't know the Bible. They don't know, they don't know like I do, you know, and all that other stuff. It's like the game Shoots and Ladders. You ever play Shoots and Ladders? Love that game, all right? But I hated landing on that ladder right when I'm about to win. You land on that ladder at the back and go, yeah, bow, straight back to the bottom. You know what I'm saying when you play that game? There's all these little traps everywhere. You got to be careful. If you land on a ladder, you go backwards. And there's that mega ladder. Like literally, it's like three away from the end. And when you're almost there and you land on that one, now you went from first to last. That's the ladder. There's the, the devil has a ladder for us like that. So it's a, you know, that shoot. I'm sorry. That's the shoot, the, the slide. You can, as you grow in your holiness, as you grow closer to God, and as you grow and God is using you, God can use you in a mighty way. You got to be careful. It's always, it is not me. It is Christ who lives in me. This is not me. And you don't, you don't, you can easily go from, I'm living for you. I'm loving for you. It's like, oh, I'm loving what I'm doing right now. And you can now get your sense of worth and appreciation and affirmation from what you do for God rather than who he is for you. You see the, the, the trap? And so that's his will. His will is for you to grow there. But I'm telling you, the enemy has a will for you. And the enemy's will is not for you to keep going. He wants to put whatever trap so you can go backwards as fast as possible, as many times as possible. And so you got to be careful. And so lastly, let me, let me anchor with this one as, as we're going to Get, get to the application for today. Because we've been praying this, right? Lord, may your will be done, which involves the kingdom. May, the, may I have a relationship with the king. May your will be done. Lord, Lord, so you tell me, what, what do you want? What does this relationship look like? We already talked about his divine plan, his sovereign plan. Sorry, his divine command. It's in his word. We can grow in understanding and not truly really knowing it. It's about becoming more than doing. But here's the beautiful, wonderful part of this whole thing. You and I can pray for God's will to be done because Jesus prayed it first. Now, this is where I want you to lean. I want you to really lean in and catch this. Because the only reason why you and I are able to pray, may your will be done, is because Jesus prayed it first. And he prayed it in Matthew 26, verse 39. Before there was a crucifixion, before there was a resurrection, before there was a crucifixion, 
before they had to beat him and whip him, before they did any of that, before they tried him, falsely accusing him, there was a garden. And there was a moment when it was just Jesus and his father all alone. And Jesus prayed over and over again. He was praying. And in that prayer, he prayed this three times. Guys, every time we see like even a repetition of things, why in the Bible you ever see God is holy, holy, holy. It's just, you know, uh, an ancient way of just showing an infinite. Like it's just amazing. A, a triple repetition is something wonderful, beautiful, right? If, if mom ever has to repeat herself once, that's a big deal. If she has to repeat herself a second time, yikes, right? You got to be careful. So listen, when God repeats himself, shouldn't you be paying attention a little bit more? If he says it a second time, you should pay attention. If he says it a third time, Lean in because he really wants you to hear this. Jesus three times prayed the same prayer. You know what the prayer was? Lord, if there is a way, if it is possible for this cup to pass from me, but if not, not my will, but may your will be done. What does that cup mean? See, at that moment when Jesus was all alone in the garden, he knew, he, he knew the timer, he saw the timer, it's almost, this is the moment. I came to the world to do this very thing and it's about to happen, it's go time. And he has this moment with his father. And he says, Lord, if this cup, meaning if I, I, you know, the cross, the cup was the cup of his wrath because Jesus knew to die on the cross was to stand alone before God, the, the father, to stand alone before the father and be judged by every sin that everybody that has ever lived has ever done collectively that's what he was supposed to die for the sins of the world and that means he had to be punished for all of our sins even though he never did it he was going to be punished for it now this is a scary verse when jesus says look if if if, my, if this cup can pass from me then that used to scare me for a minute because i used to read that i'm saying wait jesus what you saying dog were you were you like all thinking like were you rethinking this you know, like, was he at one point, like, was like oh, it's going to happen. Oh, it's, it's almost, um, 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 can we, is there another way? Can, can we, you know, figure this out, you know, can, think, you know, like, I don't know. Like, for a minute, I thought, there was a time that I read this, and I'm like, it, did, the, did our history, did our destiny hang in the balance of that prayer? Was there a moment in which Jesus was not going to do that? I don't know. Like, I really wondered. I mean, our destiny did hang on that prayer. Jesus prays that differently. We're not here. But here's the thing. How did, why did Jesus pray that? Because at first it almost looks like he's having doubts. Could Jesus doubt? Martin Luther, I read this quote. I couldn't believe this dude said this. Martin Luther was a great theologian back in the day. He said, speaking about this moment when Jesus said those words, never did a man fear death like this one. Never did a man fear death like this one. You know, um, I don't know about you. I think I've heard some people say, listen, I'm, I'm not afraid to die because I know like, if they're a believer, I've heard this. I'm not afraid to die because I know I'm going to be with God. But I ain't going to lie. I'm afraid about how I'm going to die. You know, I think that there's a struggle with that, right? And like saying, look, we all, we all want to the, we all wanted to go to the destination. No one wants to go for the ride. You know, like that's the reality of it. No one wants to go for that ride. They're scared about that. Is that what Jesus is doing? See, in this moment, when he is confronted with the wrath of God, you got to remember that Jesus is not only a man. He's also a God. Jesus is fully man, fully God. Truly man, truly God. There's some that say that Jesus did everything in this world not as God. He did it as a man in perfect relationship with God. That is borderline heresy, heretical. That's crazy. Because that means that if Jesus did it as a man not as God and as a man in relation with God, that means I can do certain things in the same way, in the same power and same, stop it, you're not him. You're not him. Jesus never turned his God mode off. He was always God, always man. Fully God, fully man. And it was at this moment, guys, that is huge. Because see, when he prayed, may this, if there's a way for this cup to pass, his humanity, his human, his humanity was shrinking at 
the, at, fa at, 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 at uh, when he was facing death. His humanity was shrinking when he was face to face, not just with death and how he was going to die, but the wrath of God that he was about. His humanity was shrinking. And when Jesus said, if there is a way for this to pass, that was his humanity. But and then immediately he goes, but not my will, yours be done. At that moment, because I want you to say Jesus was never having second thoughts. Because Jesus knew my will is always to please and do the will of the Father. And the will of the Father was what? For, the fa for God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. Jesus didn't get sent. And we're like, wait, why'd you? this is why you sent me? Like he, he knew what he signed up for. He knew what he signed up for. Jesus came into this world knowing this is what it was. He never had a conflict of his will. But there was this human desire inside. The humanity in him was shrinking. Oh, my gosh. Oh, he was, you know. But he said, not my will, yours be done. At that moment, Jesus submitted his human desire perfectly to the will of God. Guys, you and I can't do that. You and I can't do that. How often when it's, Lord, is there a, you know, can, can this cup pass from me? You and I always want the cup. You know, I don't want his will. I want what I want. That's what we've been saying this whole time. And in the moment, Jesus was tempted. His humanity was tempted to find another way. But because he was not just man, he was God. He submitted his will perfectly to the will of God. This is why Jesus says, I know what it's like to be human. And Jesus was tempted in every which way, yet never sinned once. He never sinned. And because Jesus prayed, not my will, yours be done. That's why we are here today hearing that is why it is good news because of what jesus did we can't do that guys we cannot do that now, but he did and i'm glad he did because now we can pray that prayer a little differently and so what i want to encourage you guys and i want you to look at this as we're rounding third base now we have now done three petitions of the lord's prayer what are they may your name be honored as holy may your kingdom come may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven guys we're at halftime right now all right, I know the Super Bowl is going to happen in a couple weeks. We have uh, games happening today, right? If you've ever played a game, what is halftime for, right? You halftime is a time to pause, time to reflect, time to get back together, you know? All right, what are we going to do? We've got to rally back. That's what halftime is for. We're at halftime of this prayer. And I want you to understand that the, everything that we have learned to pray right now should not just be a prayer. It should be prayers that are done as praise. These are prayers that we should be done as praise. You know why? Because think of this. All of these prayers should be rooted in the past, present, and future. When you pray, Lord, may your name be honored as holy, you ought to pray knowing God has, his name has been honored. Jesus honored the name of, the, of, of his father in heaven. Jesus right now, his name is holy. There's no name above all. It's just him. And so when we pray, Lord, may your name be honored as holy, we pray that with praise, knowing that in the past God has honored his name as holy, that his kingdom has come because of what Jesus did on the cross and through the grave. And that, Lord, when we pray for his will to be done, we should pray with praise, knowing that God in the past has executed his will faithfully. And then we pray in the present. Because he's done it in the past, we pray in the present. Lord, may your name be honored as holy now. May you help me to live a life that honors you, takes you seriously, and sees you as someone special and there is nothing else. Lord, may your kingdom come. May I continue to grow in this relationship. And what does it mean that who I am in you, my identity is rooted in you. And may your will be done now. Lord, may, may you continue to change me and, and transform me so I can live and according to how you desire. That is a present tense. But listen, you should also pray these three things in the future. Because when you pray, may your name be honored as holy, you should pray that with praise, knowing that one day his name will be honored as holy when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When you pray, may your kingdom come today, you pray it knowing that the king is coming back. And you know that he will establish his kingdom now and forever. And once he does, it is all over after that. And when you pray for the Lord's will to be done today, you pray with confidence knowing that his will will be done, that Christ will return, that he will defeat his enemies, that he will make a people of all nations, of every tribe and color and shade and everything in between. He will make a people for himself and we will spend eternity with him forever. You pray these things in the present, 
knowing about the past and knowing in light of the future. This isn't just a simple, what do you want me to do today? Do you see how pathetic that prayer is now? Do you see how pathetic that prayer is now? What do you want me to do today? It is a pathetic way to pray. But I want to warn you because if you dare to pray, may your will be done. Something has to die for his will to be done. For the Father's will to be done, Jesus died on the cross and had life. Do you want God's will to be done? Yours has to die. Yours has to die. This is why Jesus says, pick up your cross daily. Follow me. Every day we got to die to ourselves. The more we die to ourselves, the more we die, the more we follow God's will. And this is something, guys, how do we die inside? The truth of God. Have you ever had somebody tell you something and you're like, you heard this truth and you're like, oh my gosh, it's like, I'm dying. You know, like, it, it, you know, when you hear a truth that hits you, I'm like, I'm dead inside. You know, now it's just because I heard that. The truth of God is what does that in us, guys. And so I want to encourage you when you pray, and I want to encourage you to do that today. May you pray, may your will be done. I want to know what you're doing when you pray that prayer. May your will be done is, Lord, may your will, not mine, but yours be done. Because if you don't tell God, Lord, not my will, may yours be done, God will one day tell you, oh, not my will? Okay, then yours be done. Get away from me. I never knew you. If you don't tell it to him, honestly, he will tell it to you. And that is not a word that he is looking forward to saying. Not to any of us. He loves us too much. And so to pray, Lord, may your will be done, is to say, Lord, change my desires and make them more aligned with you. Help me to become, Lord, I'm, I'm still impatient. I'm still this. I'm still that. Help me to become more like you, Jesus. May your will be done. May I continue to grow in this and walk in this relationship with you, not in the lustful passions, Lord, but according to the Spirit, according to your word. When you pray, may your will be done. Guys, you should pray, Lord, may salvation come to so-and-so because we know that his will is for all men to be saved. And so when you pray, your will be done. Again, stop thinking of yourself. Think of someone else. Who do you know that needs to be saved? Lord, may your will be done. And may this person be saved in Jesus' name. And Lord, may your will be done because his will is for his people to produce good fruit, reflect others, even telling others about Jesus. And a lot of you don't want to tell anybody about Jesus because you're embarrassed. I don't want to tell anybody about Jesus. I don't want to tell anybody about being a Christian. I'm not going to tell them, do you want to believe in Jesus? I'm a Christian. You want to be a Christian? I don't want to say that. Why? Well, because I'm not perfect. I, I got issues. I'm, I'm, not follow, I'm, I'm not walking in this walk perfectly. Are you asking them to follow Jesus or are you asking them to follow you? Are you asking them to follow Jesus or you? Your imperfect streak of whatever it looks like to be a believer is not what disqualifies you. It's actually the thing that you should hold up and highlight even more. I'm like saying, listen, you know me, right? I'm a hot mess, right? But you know what's helping me? I believe in Jesus. And he has he's done this in my life and he's given me, don't follow me, follow him. You should not be embarrassed about, I mean, you should be embarrassed, but you know what I'm saying? Like you shouldn't, don't be so much. Tell others, don't sit on the sideline, get engaged. It was like, well, I'm not perfect. No one is going to be. Even if you think, you know, I know some people look at me, I'm like saying, bro, I, I miss more than I hit. Trust me. Don't sit on the sideline. Get going, work, save, do, fall. I don't care. You are not telling people. That's his will, by the way. Oh, you want, what's, what do you want me to do? Tell other, people, you know, tell other people about me. No, not that. Anything about that. His will is for you to know him, and his will is for you to make him known. You want his will? That's what it is. And I'm going to end with one last verse. Let me end with Paul's verse. I'm just going to read it to you. I'm not going to expound on it. I'm just going to let it, I'm just going to let it speak. Colossians 1, 9 through 13. He says this, we are asking this of you. But you got to understand the Holy Spirit is also part of that we. And the Spirit of the living God is asking this of us. God, we are asking this of you, church, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, continually filled, by the way, with wisdom and spiritual understanding, again, growing, so that you may walk, there's the becoming, you see what I'm saying? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing, there's the grace again, in the knowledge of God. So be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance, patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you, look, it's him in you, to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. 
for he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his son he loves. In him we have redemption for the forgiveness of our sins. Listen, to do the will of God is to walk worthy of him. None of, you can, uh, none of us can walk worthy of him in equal status. He is not speaking of perfection here. To live a life worthy of Christ is to live a life recognizing that Christ is worthy. That's what he's saying. To live a life worthy of Christ is to recognize that Christ is worthy. And why is he worthy? Because his kingdom has come. He has transferred me from a kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. In him we have redemption for the forgiveness of our sins. His will is done every time we are in amazed and in awe of what he has done. You want his will to be done? Just keep being, worship him for what he has done. Look to what he has done. Look to who he is. And his will will be done in and through your life in a way that you can't even begin to comprehend. But one day we will. And we'll have all of eternity to give him all thanks and glory forever for what he 